Hey everyone, it's Eric Thor here. I bet you never thought you'd see me again, huh? Or perhaps you were counting the days till I caved in and started making videos again. Regardless, I'm really glad that you're here and thank you so much for tuning in. In this podcast, we're going to be doing an in-depth discussion on a wide range of topics, starting with whether personal types are fluid or fixed. And then we're going to be segueing into a discussion on creative perfectionism and how to and to which extent a creator should be critical of their own content and the things that they make. Besides that, I want to make an announcement for my new online course, which is available. The first part is already available for my patrons on patreon.com slash and the full part will be go live in March. Besides that, I want to tackle a question that is a little bit more silly and it's a question of bad luck. Can a person be unlucky and how can a person become more lucky if they are unlucky, right? In my last pieces of content, I was, I'll admit, a little bit too critical of personal types and personal typology. And I wanted to say that I never really want to be a critic in this community. I don't want to be a person that is highlighting all the flaws of different systems and models. And I understand that I'm starting to develop a bit of a bad cop reputation in this community because I'm constantly calling out bad practices and things that I don't think are ethical or things that I don't think are healthy or things that I don't think are scientific. And I wanted to say that um, I'm going to be Spending less time on criticism in the future, and while I will give room for criticism, while I think create criticism is an important thing, I want to focus on my own positive experiences and my alternatives. So, not just what's wrong with what we currently do, but a more in-depth discussion of what I think we should be doing instead, right? And how do we think about that when it comes to personality types and personality psychology, right? Well, first of all, I'm trying to advocate for a general shift in how we approach personality types. Personal types are a tool. They don't have a scientific basis. The idea of an INFJ or an ENTP, these are just carved out patterns in the spectrum of human personality, right? So we've sliced out pieces of the cake and uh, we've decided to study certain groups of patterns of behavior. So we've started to study people that are and happen to be both introverted, intuitive, feeling and perceiving, right? And those are we studied as INFPs and we're studying all the different things that they can do and all the different ranges of personal traits that exist within this personality type, right? And so people are doing that as a tool to kind of uh, go into personality psychology with a filter. Instead of studying every single personality type, they'll try to focus on traits that they think are more common in INFPs, right? And they'll ignore other types and they'll focus on their own type and they'll try to understand themselves better. So it becomes a tool for uh, focused self-discovery, right? Now, the shift that I'm advocating for is, well, of course, you're welcome to do that and to take that approach, but I'm trying to get people to build from the ground up. Focus on the personality traits and the dichotomies, then move to the cognitive functions. And after you've understood the cognitive functions, feel free to start making connections and uh, seeing how different functions integrate to create complex personalities and people, right? So the reason why I say this is because I find that uh, starting with personal types can lead to a lot of stereotypes and gross generalizations, right? Because we're talking about people uh, <laughs> Often, if you know, if you take 16 personality types, you're taking 8 billion people, you're taking half a billion people per personality type on average, right? So we're generalizing about half a billion people in the world, and we're telling people, you know, how they should act and how they should think and what they things they do, but we don't know why they do these things. You know, if you don't know how personality typology works, if you don't know the current functions, if you don't know the personality traits. What you're doing is you're just like looking at generally, oh yeah, these things, but you don't know why these things, you know, <laughs> you're seeing the pattern, but you don't understand where the pattern comes from or why it's like that or how that works. So I advocate for what you could call scientific reductionism here, like go down back to the basics, scale it down to the most essential and build from there like Lego, right? I do this also to help uh, people avoid the confusion that inevitably comes about from uh, looking at things only from the bigger picture and from the top down. So if you only focus on the personnel types and you start comparing them, you'll find that a lot of things are similar, right? So you get stuck. Maybe I'm an ENFP or an ENTP, right? And you start doubting it and you start looking at the different descriptions and you find that, oh, I relate to both of these. 
but you're not understanding the fuller picture of why ENFPs and ENTPs do these things and why they might have those patterns. And you're not understanding the range within an ENFP and an ENTP and to which extent they might converge and why they might sometimes look similar or think similarly. Because ultimately, we are all human, right? So we are all human, which means we share... <laughs> A generally similar capacity for being able to do the same amount of things. Anyone can do anything. Anyone can look in any way or act in any way or appear in any way, depending on the situation and their mood and their context. And that's the second shift that I'm trying to advocate for. I think we need to get better at understanding personality in context. Context of flow, stress, anxiety, context of which situation you are in, if you're by yourself, if you're at work, in your social situation, or during create recreative activities or hobbies, right? Because we are different in different situations. And when you study yourself and you look at that, you might ignore many contexts and focus only on a few contexts. And you might, if you don't know the context of a question or a situation, you might uh, answer differently depending on which context you imagine yourself in. Well, at work, I am very disciplined because they pay me to be, right? Uh, while at home, I'm quite relaxed and I, my house is a mess, you know, because I don't, I prioritize my work more. So... <laughs> Yeah, these are some of the limitations that I see with typology today. So I'm trying to say, like, I'm trying to advocate for a bottom-up uh, version of typology, scaling it back to the essentials, and focusing more on context and situation than before. So that's what I'm working on right now. That's my goal for the future, for how I talk about typology. I want to talk about creative perfectionism, right? Because uh, creative perfectionism has been something that I've struggled with since I started on YouTube. And how did I get past it? Well, first of all, it took me a long time, right? Because I started in 2007, but as you might notice, I don't have a lot of videos live since 2007. Why is that? Well, it's because of creative perfectionism. You know, if I look at that content today, you know, uh, I'd just be like, that's terrible, that's awful, how could I ever have made something like that? And that's a general problem that most creators go through, you know, there, there's a continuous process of growth, new learning, new insight, you know, so your content, your quality, your delivery, everything is constantly improving and changing. Perhaps not improving to everyone, perhaps some people eventually feel like, no, it's getting worse and I'm not happy with this kind of content, perhaps this is not for me, and you know, personal taste can shift, right? But uh, for the creator themselves, they perceive themselves as seeing a continuous line of growth and, you know, as that happens, you know, you start judging your old work and you start feeling like it's not good enough and uh, it's very tempting then to press the delete button, which I did, you know, I deleted all those videos and they're gone now, I don't have them anymore, I wish I did. Uh, what I should have done is just unlist them, right, but I deleted them, I was that dramatic. <laughs> uh, and uh, so... Um, a general thing is, you know, you should appreciate your current process, right? Because you should be able to see that, you know, oh, this video was what started me thinking about these questions, which is what got me here. And because I did this video, I learned how to do this and this and this better. And because of that, I'm where I am today. And if you don't allow yourself that process, you're never going to grow. So you should constantly make sure that your creative perfectionism is not so big that it keeps you from putting out new content. Because if it keeps you from putting out new content and if it keeps you from making new things, well, it's not a very healthy creative perfectionism because it's not teaching you anything, right? Because if you're not making videos, you're not learning how to make better videos. If you're only being critical of yourself and constantly looking at how you can do things better, you're not gonna learn because you make the ladder too big, you know. The amount of challenge and criticism that you expose to your work should be relative to how passionate you feel about the content and to how much content you're able to make. So there is a balancing act here in the sense that you have to make sure that you keep putting things out there and keep putting yourself out there, that you keep making new videos and you keep learning and growing, right? And secondly, you should definitely be critical of your own work. So imagine you're in a situation where all your ideas feel like crap, right? So you're making videos, but you're not happy with anything. All your ideas that you come up with feel shit. Nothing feels good enough. Well, first of all, it's okay, you know. These days, YouTube and most social medias don't push or require you to post daily or weekly, you know, anymore. There is no pressure time-wise to make sure that you have something out tomorrow. And if you need more time to get this right, take the time. 
uh, that's absolutely fine. Say that even if you can take a month off or even if you take two months off, you know, don't let it discourage you from creating, you know, stay creative in the process. Even if you don't post everything live and even if you don't share everything with your community, allow yourself to create and to put ideas out there and to share them with friends and family and to get their perspective because you need to keep making things, right? Keep testing things out, trying out new angles, new cameras, new lighting, new different things that make your videos feel more fun and make you and uh, make you feel like you're having a continuous progression. Don't end up in a dry desert of uh, you know nothingness, you know, because that's ultimately the most soul killing, right? To be a creator but to not be able to create. That's the worst experience ever. When you're a creator, you're just full of this inner passion to share something with the world and to make something of your own, to add your own color inside of you to the world around you. So if you don't create, you're keeping your color inside of you and you're not able to put it out there and the world starts to look more gray because of it. And uh, so a lot of the time when I feel like, oh, nothing matters and I'm completely you know, out of my use, you know, and everything just feels uh, pointless, you know. It's because I haven't been able to create for the longest time and it's a need. It's not just uh, something you do for fun. It's a need to create, a need to actualize your own potential to the world around you and to the things that you do. If you are yourself and if you feel like you uh, know who you are and if you feel very strongly in tune with yourself and your own values and what you want to do, well, you have to do it. It's not, and it's a need to do it. It's a need to make sure that you manifest that in your writing, in your voice, in how you talk, in everything that you do. The third part you might struggle with is, you know, the sense of imposter syndrome. Like, who would ever want to watch my videos? Who would ever care for my content? Well, most importantly, uh, you should care for your content. You should want to watch your own content. You should want to. You should enjoy the kind of videos that you do. The videos that you do should be the videos that you want to watch. If you have a YouTuber that you love to watch, if you have certain kind of videos that you really enjoy watching, you should be making those kind of videos, right? Because, uh, uh, Ultimately, it's a personal expression. It's not about audience. It's not about what, uh, whether you get popular or not. It's whether you enjoy the things that you do, whether you find joy in your process, if the things that you make are things that you like and that yeah, really spark joy in you, right? If you're an artist and you love manga and a certain style of manga, you know, you should draw that style of manga because that's yeah, it, that's the most fulfilling because you're uh, putting something out there that you are passionate about and that you care about. There's also the general feeling that everyone experiences self-doubt sometimes. And the healthy version, I realized recently, um, the healthy version of imposter syndrome is modesty. Modesty and humility. The recognition that, you know, I'm not better than anyone else. My content is not better than anyone else's. Everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has something beautiful to say. Everyone has something that would be fascinating for the world to know about. So every one of us has something that's beautiful and my things are not more beautiful than any other of your things, you know. We are all ultimately human and none of us are perfect. None of the things that we do are amazing. It's just our story. It's who we are, right? So the things that you do, the things that you create should be a reflection of who you are. It shouldn't be the best thing in the world. It should be a reflection of who you are and what kind of a person you want to be. When you feel that critical urge, which is, you know, pushing down on you and telling you, you know, the things you do suck, they're not good enough, they're not worth, well, you know, tell yourself, ask yourself this, is this my truth? Is this my story? Is this how I feel? Well, if it does, it already meets one of the primary criteria for whether it's worth putting out there. At the same time, you know, there is a merit to being able to recognize that you can always improve and you can always make things better and you can always add more things, but you should always think of it as platforms that you jump from, right? So it's a platform game. It's not, uh, you don't have one product that you're continuously improving on and trying to make better. You have constant streams of new products that you keep putting out. Version 1, version 1.1, version 1.2, version 2, you know. And you are working from these platforms. These are, you know, uh, GitHub branches. So sorry, that's a bad metaphor. <laughs> these are, you know, like, this is, uh, yeah, um, constant innovation. This is the process of constant innovation. If you are stuck on project number one and you never put it out there, 
you're never going to have that version control of being able to see how things progress from where you go. And you're never going to have that sense of learning process because you're also not going to get any feedback from your users or in this case, your viewers, right? So if you don't have any feedback from your viewers, no questions, no audience support, no people leaving likes, no people pushing you or promoting you, how are you going to feel passionate about what you do if you don't put things out there and if you don't create them and share them with your friends and family? And if you don't get their feedback on what you do, you know, like, how are you going to stay motivated? That's a general question for you. You know, like you have to make sure that you surround yourself with positive people that support and cheer you on and that uh, give you energy and ask you the right questions and give you the right critical feedback so that you can keep growing, keep learning and keep going in the right direction. What got me consistently posting on YouTube and pushing things forward was first feeling like I had no choice. I had to do it. I kept trying, I'd removed my channel so many times and restarted, you know, but at some point I just resigned myself to the feeling like I have to put it out there no matter what, you know, it has to be there. It, I can't not do it because yeah, I really need to get this rolling because for me, like I built so much of my happiness and my joy on the question of whether I would be able to make it as a creator or not. Uh, and it was good for me to let go of my critical thinking for a while and to stop being so harsh on myself in my videos. But I did have a moment where I realized that critical thinking is also something very important. So let me tell you my story about this. So first of all, the primary reason why I, uh, yeah, made the commitment to YouTube and kept putting out videos, even if I weren't always completely happy with those videos. And even if I felt like I could have done better with many of these things, you know, the main thing that I did was because I noticed my audience liked it. And, you know, I thought to myself, if my audience likes it, who am I to tell them it's a bad video and to take it away from them? You know, if there are people out there that can relate and can enjoy and can connect to my content, who am I to tell them that their hobby sucks and that their values suck and that they're not right to like my videos. You know, that's, that's a kind of weird thing to do, right? So you kind of have to resign yourself to, well, if other people like and relate to this, I have to give them the chance to enjoy those things. And I can't take that away from people. And I can only be grateful for the fact that they're there and that they're supporting me. Even if I'm not completely happy with what I do, I, you know, they, I'm glad that they appreciate it and resonate with it. Right. But after a while, I realized I needed to start thinking critically again. And uh, so about a year back, I had the experience of being able to imagine all my subscribers watching my videos, which was a really tough thing to do. You know, it was an amazing thing to do in many ways. I saw the faces of every subscriber, you know, spread out over a football stadium, like all the people that have tuned in to watch my videos over the years. And, you know, I realized that every single one of these people, if I zoom in, you know, has a face, has a life, has relationships, has struggles, has anxiety, has all these things that they're dealing with, right? And, you know, so that means that I'm having a real impact on people across the world and how they feel throughout the day and, you know, on uh, their life and what they do, you know. And so, in a sense, first, that was an amazing discovery, right? But second, it became a sense of duty because if I, every single person is real, uh, they, they deserve my best work. They deserve my best content. They deserve uh, the best of what I could possibly do. And that meant I also felt I had to give something more positive and good to the world than what I did in the past. And that's what got me into this spiral of taking a very long and hard look at my content. As you might have noticed, more than half of my videos now have been unlisted and so many things have been removed from the channel and there are still videos out there that I'm not feeling, I, I don't feel like people should be watching. And uh, it's from this uh, realization that, well, it comes from this recognition that I have to remember who I am. It's that, it's my Simba moment, you know, looking up at, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the sky and seeing my ancestors looking down at me, you know, like, uh, I had this Simba moment of, you know, remember who you are, Eric, you know, like, uh, so I had to take a hard look at my content and I had to take a hard look at everything that I've done up till this point. And I had to think about what kind of a legacy do I want to leave behind? And that's the question of, you know, what do I want people to remember from me, you know, 
do I want them to remember me as the critic that went against different systems, the idiot that babbled about things he didn't know? Do I want people to look at me as, you know, uh, the person that, uh, you know, uh, you know, what kind of a person do I want to be ultimately? Who is my ideal version of myself? What kind of a message do I want to share with the world? What do I want people to remember me for? Well, I want people to remember me for, for a lot of things, but I want people to remember me as compassionate and empathetic, right? I want people to remember me as a creative, a positive thinker, somebody that showed people new ways forward. And I want people to remember me for... Um, the stories that I tell and um, for my the the perspectives that I share and you know uh, yeah my ability to be human human in the sense that you know my message should be one of compassion and acceptance of myself and others in a sense it should be a message that uh, everyone is beautiful and amazing and has a story to share and it should be a message that you know everyone matters. Uh, and that uh, we are allowed to have bad feelings and struggles. We're allowed to uh, experience hardships. We're allowed to feel bad and anxious sometimes. We're allowed to everything, you know. Uh, and we are all these things because we're all human. And I want people to recognize that because self-development can be a very perfectionistic process of thinking or moving to become some kind of an ubermensch, you know, some kind of post-human that has no bad feelings, that is always happy, that's always great, that is always doing amazing things and never makes any mistakes, right? But I don't want to share that message with people. I want to share the message of the ultimate human as the person that is the most human, right? The person that's the most capable of being vulnerable, the person who is the most capable of not just being positive, but also sharing negative experiences in a positive and, uh, you know, uplifting way, showing it as a step forward, sharing it as, you know, their journey and learning and sharing that it's something that they do, that's something that everyone does, something that we all can relate to and, you know, work together and help each other with. So, yeah, that's a very important thing for me to do. And I have wanted to become more open-minded in my content in the sense that I wanted to share my ideas uh, with more skepticism and inviting more creative and discussion and dialogue and what I said, because I wasn't completely happy with the response my videos were getting, right? So I was feeling like a lot of the time I was posting videos and I didn't get a lot of comments. I got a lot of people that were like, yeah, that's me. And I agree with that. And yeah, that feels uh, very relatable. But I never really got people that said, you know, I don't sure I agree with that. And um, I think you're wrong about this point. And I think this is not right, you know. And I wanted to foster a more critical dialogue because I felt like, you know, we should be all out to have our own opinions about what we hear. And everyone should think critically about the content that they consume and watch, right? So we should allow ourselves to also question when we have questions and to share a different perspective. So I want to be more transparent to achieve that. My, I see, my idea is that I should be more transparent with my thought process. It's hard for me to share my thoughts with the world. <laughs> I often keep my thoughts to myself while sharing my feelings quite openly and quite transparently. Often my thoughts are often kept inside, so I don't necessarily explain why I come to the decisions that I do or why I think the way I do or how I arrive at the conclusion that I did. But if I did, I think a lot of people would have a lot of opinions about it. They'll say, you know, I think you went too far in this regard, or I think uh, this sounds a bit uh, shaky, or this argument doesn't sound completely right or completely fair, you know. So that's something that I want to learn to do, to be more transparent and open with my thoughts to the world so that, yeah, uh, other people can correct my process and work with me on that process so we can arrive to smarter conclusions and more accurate insights. Now in that whole thing, perhaps we should be taking a discussion about my new channel and the future of my content. So at the moment, there is still no new YouTube channel. Why not? Well, main reason, I have a full-time job. I just started a new full-time job. It's really overwhelming. It's a lot of work. I'm, I have so much to learn. I have so much to do. And I didn't have the time, right? The second explanation, a little bit weaker, but I was making an online course and it took a lot of time and effort to make that right and to improve that. And the third part is, you know, the process of determining what I want the content and the channel to be. Because the most important thing is that I can create a channel where I can uh, express 
uh, yeah, the kind of videos that I want to make because I don't want to, you know, what can happen to many creators on YouTube is they get stuck in a niche and they're only allowed to make a certain kind of videos and that can feel quite stifling to a lot of creatives and YouTubers out there, you know, the feeling like you're not allowed to make the kind of content that you want to make and if you do make the kind of content that you want to make, nobody's gonna watch it because they subscribed to your channel to watch a certain kind of content and they don't care about anything else, you know. Uh, of course I have people that do watch and that are interested in other things that I do and like my new direction and new perspective, but not everyone does, right? Then uh, to the YouTube algorithm is if just 30% of my current audience are unhappy with the video that I made, they're not gonna recommend that to anyone else because if my main audience doesn't like it, who else is gonna like it, right? <laughs> so uh, there is something to be said about the YouTube algorithm there and this is why a lot of YouTubers start new channels because if you want to do a new thing and if you want to start in a new direction, you have to, uh, to give that idea a genuine chance to succeed. You have to make a new channel for it and allow it to grow organically, naturally from that point. Because if your old audience doesn't like your new direction and doesn't like your new kind of videos, that doesn't mean that there aren't other people out there that could. There are other people out there that might really like this kind of video, might like and I really appreciate it, right? Uh, but uh, your current audience might not like it, right? So you have to consider what do I do in those situations? And uh, well, the best strategy to help the YouTube algorithm out a little bit is make a new channel and let that one grow organically from, yeah, what it is and from itself on to grow on its own merit. Let it find its own audience and the kind of people that are interested in those kind of videos and avoid making too many changes to that. So what are my general ideas for this kind of a channel? Well, first of all, I have some generals that I try to follow. I'm looking to uh, make kind of school of life uh, style videos where I address real problems that people struggle with in the world today, you know from relationship issues to self-doubt to, you know, being your best version of yourself to finding flow. I wanted to make kind of videos that, you know, uh, make people feel a bit better about themselves and to give people a sense of direction. I wanted to give people quests and uh, things that they can do in their day-to-day -day lives that can make a positive impact in their life and their happiness and in their well-being. So I wanted to work a lot with applied psychology uh, applied psychology in the sense of not just theories and speculation, uh, which I might share here on the main channel or on other areas, you know, but also, you know, practical applied advice that you can apply in your life right away, right? And besides talking about personality types, which is what I got famous for, you know, making videos about INFJs and INFPs, I wanted to make videos about archetypes that are more universally relatable. So I wanted to talk about the stranger and uh, feeling like an alien or feeling different or feeling like an outsider, for example. Or I might want to make a video about feeling like a wallflower, feeling like an invisible woman or man, you know. I wanted to talk about movie tropes, you know, and, you know, storytelling tro tropes and, you know, these things that we can all relate to because we've all been there sometimes or we can know what it might feel like to be there in that situation, right? Because what can it feel like when people don't listen to you or don't see you or what can it feel like when you're you feel different and when you feel alienated from other people or how can it feel you know to be these things so I wanted to create these use these kind of archetypes you know to create kind of a real tangible image that you know people could use to know you know like uh, that I see you right because I do see you I make videos for you I make videos for my audience I I read your comments. Uh, sorry to say it if you don't want to be read or seen, uh, but I do read your comments, right? And I listen to your messages and I think about the things that you tell me and I go out on the streets and I talk to people, right? And I hear their stories. I want to tell your stories. I want to tell stories that can help you, that can make you feel better about your life, that can help you grow and that can make you feel like you can have new direction and that you are seen and heard and accepted for who you are. And then I wanted to create a story or a kind of a landscape where you can see this archetype in this yeah, world experiencing this kind of dilemma or this kind of a struggle because life can be a struggle sometimes. It can be a harsh, harsh experience, you know. Uh, so I wanted to create that contrast between, you know, the protagonist, you know, whatever archetype I let play the role of the protagonist in this world, which represents, you know, the thing that they struggle with the most. 
And I wanted to give, in that sense, in that environment, I wanted to give a quest or a main mission or something that you can do to, you know, move forward from there. So those are my general ideas for it. Of course, I have the general standards, you know, that I've been working on, that my content should be more empathetic and positive, that I should be more constructive in my criticism in the future rather than just critical of something. I should offer constructive advice and feedback. Besides that, I should be open-minded and more modest in my delivery. I shouldn't, even though I'm very passionate and feel very strongly about what I feel, you know, I should be very transparent with you all because I'm an open-minded person, I'm a modest person, and I constantly learn as I go, right? So I'm constantly improving. So if I can share that I'm open-minded to your point of view and your perspective, I think it's a lot easier to listen to what I say because what I say is not the absolute truth and it never has been. It's my current understanding of a topic, right? So after 10 years of study, my current understanding of this situation is this, right? And the questions that I have, the doubts that I have about this and the things that I'm wor working about or trying to change or adjust are these, you know? I wanted to show you guys, you know, the things that, uh, the flaws of my own reasoning, the issues that I'm currently working on, the questions that I'm still doubting, you know, so that we can have this sense of continuous growth and learning together. Let's talk about bad luck. Bad luck is a bit of a funny segue, segue isn't it, right? Uh, so why am I mentioning this topic? Well, because, you know, um, I've always found it interesting, you know, the, uh, the topic of luck, very interesting. I've always identified as a very lucky person, right? Because whatever I want, I seem to get, you know, like no matter what, you know, how tight it is, you know, for in the past few years, I've struggled like in the red in the economy financially. I've struggled with poor economy, bad financial decisions, uh, debt, and a lot of issues like that, right? So, uh, and that's been purely my own fault, you know, like I made bad decisions, I didn't think about things uh, too critically, I didn't, uh, I was too idealistic about things, and uh, I took too many risks. And uh, so nobody should feel bad about me for, you know, struggling through these things, you know. Um, I, I signed on contracts without reading the contract properly, and then I didn't get paid the way I expected to, you know, uh, because it was in Dutch or, you know, my employer got bankrupt and couldn't afford to pay me his salary, you know, like things like that. And these things happen, you know, it can happen to anyone, you know, we can all go through experiences where we have, where we are unlucky, right? You know, like you're not getting back your, uh, mortgage that you put on your apartment after the end of the month, because, uh, yeah whatever reason, you know, like all these things can happen and we can all go through these like bad experiences of being unlucky. This Monday, for example, I went to the office. I have to commute about two hours to get to my office. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I missed the train by one minute. You might think, really? I missed it by one minute. I was just there. I saw the doors close and f saw the train leave. Next one leaves in 30 minutes. It happens, you know. So, uh, I waited, got on the next train, and uh, the train doesn't leave the station. Suddenly the conductor talks on the radio and says, as you might have noticed, we have not left the station yet. And uh, why? I don't know. I have no idea. What you can do about it? No idea. How long it's gonna take? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> That's how he said it, basically. And uh, I just laughed. I just found it amusing. Like, I think a lot of people are like, what the hell? What the hell is this? You know, and I, I just laughed. I just, I don't know. I found the situation completely uh, hilarious. And, um, you know, what I did then was, uh, I left. Uh, we got kicked off the train. So I just, I just left and I went, you know, out for a bite and, uh, you know, took a little bit of a walk. And then I came back an hour later, got to the next train. I was home around nine o'clock in the evening or something like that, because it, you know, it was uh, quite late. Uh, and uh, with these things, you know, like uh, the only thing you can change, right, is your own attitude, right? And what is it that makes a lucky person a lucky person? I think it's, you know, how you deal with bad things, because if you, you know, if something bad happens to you, the general impulse is to get upset about it, right? And to feel negative and to feel down and to feel disappointed. And that negative feeling can make you make bad decisions because when you're in that bad state, I'm not saying you're not allowed to feel those things, you're totally allowed to feel those things. But I'm saying when you're in that bad state, you might make your life even more difficult for yourself, right? Because you might, uh, you know, you sit on the station and wait for the next train and you might get 
gradually more and more frustrated that there's nothing happening, you know. Uh, but the lucky person, I believe, makes their own happiness, makes their own future, makes their own fortune, which means, you know, you, your next move is not necessarily, even if you feel bad about it, and even if you allow yourself to feel set, upset about it, you know, you don't stay in that feeling, you don't make bad decisions that make you even more upset, you make good decisions that make you happy. So you think about, okay, what can I do instead to feel better? You know, what can I do to motivate myself, to make myself happy, to make myself yeah, generally relax and feel a bit more good about myself, you know. And uh, that's why, for example, if a friend is half an hour late, trains don't go, you know, plans go to hell, you know. When these things happen, what I do is I bring a book or I go for a walk, I watch people, I grab a coffee. You know, I enjoy the new opportunity that I was given because I was given a new opportunity here, you know. Something didn't go my way, but there's a new opportunity here. There's a new thing that I can do. There's something else that I can do to make me feel good. And because of that, I'm not really that upset about it. Because, you know, I got the chance to read a book that I really like, or I got the chance to, you know, go talk to a barista at the cafe and have a good conversation with somebody, or I got to do something else that made me feel better. And I think that's how people have to look at these things. You know, we, we can... Definitely feel bad about missed opportunities, but keep your eye open for new opportunities because a lucky person, a gambler archetype, you could say, like, is a person that keeps, you know, finding something new to roll the dice on, you know, a person that keeps finding something new to play on, you know, because a lucky person isn't an unlucky person. Well, a lucky person can still experience bad luck, but because they keep playing, they keep winning, you know, they keep having new positive experiences, you know, and when I come home, I'll tell a story of, you know, oh, uh, my train was late and then I went out and I met this really cool person, you know, and <laughs> this really amazing thing happened and people were like, wow, he's so lucky, you know, he must have been so lucky to miss that train and to get that opportunity. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's totally how it works, right? Um, anyways, those are just my experiences on the topic. I'm curious, do you feel like you're a lucky person or a bad luck person, you know, like how do you deal with that and like... Uh, yeah, what's your approach when you feel unlucky? And like, how do you process the emotions of disappointment? And how do you keep a positive and open eye? Those are my questions for you. Besides that, I want to give you all a teaser for my new online course. So that's right. I've been filming more than 90 minutes of content uh, for my new online course. And it's gonna go live in March. This course is a course on how to know who you are and how to understand your personality. I don't say type, I say your personality, and how to self-actualize, right? And it's a study in Jung and in self-actualization and the process of individuation. In it, I share insights to how you can understand the different personality traits and dichotomies and the current functions of a different person, and how you can work your way bottom up, like Lego, to a wider, a bigger understanding of yourself. Besides not just talking about the dichotomies and the cognitive functions, what I talk about in this online course is context. Who you might be in flow, who you might be in stress. The goal of this course is to help you develop a more nuanced understanding of yourself, right? Because we are not, you know, personality is not a yes or no answer where you're like always yes and never no, you know? Uh, Personality is uh, in this situation, yes, in that situation, no, and under this circumstance, yes, and under that circumstance, no. That's, that's personality. Personality is like this big blob, you know, and uh, it covers certain areas and it doesn't cover certain areas, you know. So I want people to get the sense of self-awareness where it's like you know yourself and you know how you deal with different situations and you know what kind of decisions you would make and how you'd come to that and what your thought process is. And I want people to know and be aware of these things because if you know yourself, you can make better decisions, right? You can uh, look at and notice areas of improvement. You can notice flaws that you might have, uh, issues and processing and reasoning that you might need to work on. You might notice areas of development and growth and places where you could get better. And it allows you to, by knowing the rules, you can break the rules too, right? Because uh, if you know who you are, uh, you are allowed to work and bend the rules of who you are, and what's possible, what you can do, and to do even more than what you thought possible previously, right? And that's what I want people to know. I want people to know that personality is relatively fluid and changeable, and you can make your own happiness, write your own process, and write your own journey. And the goal is not to know which personality type you best fit inside, right? Because the personality types, they're simplifications created by Isabella Briggs, uh, 
to explain Carl Jung's model of personality. Uh, the goal is not to fit yourself exactly in one personality type and to feel 100% certain that you are this personality type, because that's just a generalization to start out with. The personality type is a generalization based on a large group of people with a wide variety of ranges of personality traits and preferences and cognitive functions. So what I want you to recognize is you don't have to know what personality type you are and best fits you. You have to know who you are. You have to know what kind of values you have. You have to know how you might respond differently, regardless if you're in flow or stress or anxiety. And you have to know what kind of a person you want to be, what your ideal best version of yourself is, what your goals are, where you're moving towards in the future, like where you're headed in life and why you want to go there in the first place. Those are the kind of things that you have to know. Those are the kind of things you have to understand. So those are the insights I'm sharing in my online course. And if you are curious, the first part is already live for all my Patreons on patreon.com slash Eric Dorr. That's right. Anyone who becomes a Patreon this month can experience uh, the first part of this online course. And the full part is going to go live in March. So as a Patreon, you'll get an exclusive sneak peek to my online course. And from there, uh, you're going to have the chance to learn a lot of things about yourself. I hope that you'll learn a lot about yourself throughout my online course and throughout my workshops and throughout the things that I do in the future. Thank you so much for continuing to tune in and watch my channel. And I really appreciate having you all here. And I hope to see you all in my next video.